of starting us on our uh, study of the book of Numbers, kind of being a boring book. You, you said that here, and I agree. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and often, often we get that from the title. It's called Book Numbers. Um, it's all about numbers. It's, it starts with a census. It ends with a census. It, it's 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 a very long list of a, of, a, of a military census and a lot of numbers and a lot of listing and stuff. And so it often gets a, a a bad rap, but that's actually kind of a shame because this totally undercuts the importance of this book as a means of understanding Israel's journey uh, to the Promised Land as a part of God's redemptive plan and purpose for Israel and in turn the rest of the world in Jesus. And we're gonna be exploring that today. And although uh, the Greek Old Testament title for this book does translate to numbers, I, I think that the original Hebrew title is called Bamid Bar and it means into the wilderness. It's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit cooler that way, and it makes sense. It seems more appropriate uh, as it's the story of the Israelites' journey uh, through the wilderness and into the land that God had promised the, the descendants of Abraham, that is, the land of Canaan. And on the way, we see them work through the struggles and the challenges that, uh, that the people of God face along the way as they learn to uh, trust in God and have faith in his promise and in his power to achieve the promise. So this story starts out at the base of Mount Sinai. We're kind of um, continuing the narrative uh, from the book of Exodus, um, where God makes his covenant with Israel after delivering them out of captivity in Egypt. And the covenant was that God would bless the people as they are obedient to his laws and obedient to his ways. And we've spent the past couple months detailing the moral and sacrificial and purity laws found in the book of Leviticus. And... Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and and these laws, they were they were uh, they were to keep these things as a reminder first that God is holy and that His people need to be made right before Him before entering into His presence. And so at Sinai, it, it's it's the first location detailed in the Book of Numbers, and the Book of Numbers is actually divided into five sections spanning three locations on the way to the Promised Land. It goes like this. We've got a slide up here. I study. It goes Sinai. The journey through the wilderness to Paran, uh, the wandering in the desert, and the plains of Moab, the, uh, the edge of the promised land just by the Jordan River. The first section, Sinai, I'm just give you a little bit of a brief overview, overview just so we can kind of see the flow of the, the passage. It says, in Sinai, uh, it spans between chapters one, uh, 1 and 10, and it outlines the military census that God commands Moses to take along with the head of each of the tribes of Israel, Israel uh, where the chapters 5 and 10 are an expansion of the purity laws that we uh, see in the book of Leviticus. Chapters 10 through 12 detail the beginning of the uprising from among the people. As they're journeying to Paran, the Israelites start to complain about their hunger and their, their, it's weird, their longing to go back to Egypt, the place where they were in captivity. And even though God had been providing for them all along the way, to, uh, to uh, taking up the, the true promise and blessing the land of Canaan. Even Moses' brother and sister actually turn against him and they oppose him in front of the people. So we can kind of see that this road trip to the promised land is not off to a good start. The second location, Paran, which is found in chapters 13 and 19, is where Moses sends out the 12 spies to go scout out the land of Canaan and to assess the state of the land that God had promised to them. And although two spies, Joshua and Caleb, famous guys, they came back optimistic, they were really trusting that God would help them take up this very fruitful land that he had promised them, the ten other spies came back and they were fearful of those already inhabiting the land. They said they felt like grasshoppers in comparison to the giants that were already living there, and they refused to go in. They struck up a rebellion and wished that they could go again, go back to Egypt, or that they would have just died in the wilderness. And because of this, God honors their request, and he bars the entire adult generation from entering into the promised land, apart from the two faithful spies, Caleb and Joshua. That they, that, that generation must die out in the wilderness before the new generation can enter into God's promise. And this is what, what we know as the, the famous 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, which is outlined in chapters 20 and 21 which leads us into chapters 22 to 36, 
where the people of God travel through Moab after they've, they've, uh, the older generation has died out. It starts with a new census of the, of the, of the new generation as they enter into the promised land. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so again, we've come full circle from the beginning to the end. The book of Numbers starts with a military census and ends with with a military census. And I know that this is a, a very simplistic summary of the narrative. And, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a simplistic um, summary of the book of Numbers. But we're going to continue to expand on the narrative uh, in the coming weeks. But right now, I just want to kind of give you a general understanding of the flow of the book in hopes uh, that we can begin to kind of uncover the relevance of this stage in God's redemptive story uh, and, and parallel to Christian living. You know, to us 21st century Christians living in the here and now, trying to seek after knowing God and understanding his ways and, and dealing with, um, and, and understanding his ways and his dealings with his people in its context. And, and seek to apply these principles to our lives as an act of spiritual worship. Now, I, I know that when I grew up, I had a lot of really good pastors and teachers in my life, but I also had some that weren't so great. And I, and I find that so many of these pastors, and then, again, people who, who've come alongside me at Bible clubs, they, they find themselves to be amazing teachers. They're, they're amazing at preaching and at presenting the information. You know, they know all the Greek and the Hebrew words, or roots of all the words, and, and they can tell you how big the city of Ephesus was. And, and, but preaching of the word is more than just the trans, uh, transmission of information and ideas. Amen? Amen. Right. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah likens the call to preach God's word as a fire inside his bones. That's more than just words. The word of God is more than the presentation of information, but is a transformational agent in our lives. It's a, an encounter and an experience with the living God that leaves us changed for having come in contact with and this is true even for pastors that often seem dry, like the book of Numbers, with senses, or uh, uh, with genealogies. So before we get into studying God's Word, can we pray again and let's prepare ourselves and ask God to kind of invade our hearts as we are being transformed by the hearing of His Word and the subsequent conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray again. <coughs> Lord God, we come to you today because we can recognize our utter inability to please you and to be holy. God, won't you come now and illuminate our minds as we read your word and open up the eyes of our hearts to see your purposes as we meditate on your words. And let our hearts not be hardened, but be transformed as we seek to know you and obey you at whatever cost. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's dive right into it. If you have your Bibles, you can please open with uh, to chapters uh, 1 and 2. And I want to draw your attention back to the beginning of this book here. As previously stated, chapter 1 starts with a military census. God commands Moses to take an account of all the able-bodied men. So if you follow me from chapter 1, right, uh, verse 1 uh, through 3, you'll see uh, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of meeting with the tabernacle. On the first day of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the people of Israel, by clans, by father's house, according to the number of names, every male head by head. From twenty years old and upward, all in Israel who are able to go to war, you and Aaron shall list them company by company. And so Moses does what God commands, and he takes with him a representative from each tribe of Israel to assist him in the counting of each able-bodied man, 20 and up. But what was, the, what was the purpose of this census? We said it was a military census. And remember, as we brief, briefly uh, discussed beforehand, that the land of Canaan was inhabited already by a corrupt and evil people. And in order to take control of the land that God had promised, they would need to assemble an army. So this was a call to arms, that each man should take up in his own hands the responsibility of defending the people of God with his own life. And so Moses and the twelve representatives go on between verses 20 and 46, and you'll see it there, and you see, you see that they take an account of each man over the age of 20. You can see there's 
46,500 from the tribe of Reuben, 59,300 from the tribe of Simeon, 45,650 from uh, the tribe of Gad, and it goes on, it goes on. Uh, in total, we see that, that there were 603,550 men over 20. Now, all the tribes were accounted for except for the, uh, the tribe of Levi. The Levites, who, if you remember from our study in Leviticus, uh, they, were the, uh, they were the tribe of Israel that were set apart for the task of serving the tabernacle as priests. And the Levites, they served as mediators between God and man. They offered sacrifices for sin. Uh, they, they led the people in ritual cleanliness before God as a reminder that man sh- would need to check his heart before entering into God's presence. If you uh, skip over with me now to verse 50, it's talking about um, the Levites' exemption. It says this. It says, But appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony, and over all its furnishings, and over all that belongs to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings, and they shall take care of it, and shall camp around the tabernacle. When the tabernacle is close, to, sorry, sorry, pardon me. When the tabernacle is to set out, the, ta- the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And if any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. The people of Israel shall pitch their tents by their companies, each man in his own camp, and each man by his own standard or his own banner. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the, t- of the testimony so that uh, there may be no wrath from the congregation of the people of Israel. And the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. So God has put the Levites in charge, not just of the maintenance of the tabernacle, but the teardown and the set up whenever and wherever they move out camp on their way to the promised land. And God is actually very specific in, 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 uh, in how the maintenance and the setup ought to be for the tabernacle, as well as the surrounding camps. If you now skip ahead with me now to uh, chapter 2, uh, the first two verses, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, his brother, saying, The people of Israel shall camp each by his own standard or banner, uh, with their banners of their father's house. They shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. And so uh, God commands the camps of of each of the tribes of Israel to surround the tabernacle, and that is the place where God's presence dwelt. We have uh, the tribes of Judah, of Issachar, and Zebulun to the east, uh, uh, Reuben, Simeon, Gad to the south, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin on the west side, and finally Dan, Asher, and this is the hard one, Naphtali (laughs) to the south side. So God has this this interesting and intricate design for the setup of the camp to have the tabernacle in the middle, to have the sub-camps of the Levites surrounding and guarding the tabernacle, as well as the 12 tribes surrounding on uh, four directions. But why did God design the camp this way? Just, I want you to know that this design, it's far from arbitrary. This formation is actually a beautiful symbol for how the people of Israel, and in turn, we Christians, are to mirror and live our lives. This design serves as a reminder that God's holy presence ought to remain at the center of the Israelites' lives, to keep their laws on, his laws on their hearts and, and in their minds, and to wake up every morning to obey and to follow God no matter what. And again, having faith that God will be faithful to them in what he has promised. Remember, the purpose of this journey was actually to take up the blessings that God had promised his people, right? The land of Canaan. And so it is fitting that the whole while that they are in this process of traveling, setting up camp, picking up the journey again, setting up camp, and so on, that their dwelling place ought to act as a living symbol of the covenant God made with his people at Sinai that God would bless them in their obedience. So too, is this a reminder and a beautiful symbol for us Christians today that we are to live our lives with Christ now at the center. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means later. For now, we want to just come to this understanding of this chapters 1 and 2, that God has set apart the tribes of Israel to be warriors, soldiers, 
as a part of God's redemptive plan in giving them the land of Canaan, as well as for the Levites for the work of the temple. And all of these groups, we have to remember, were set apart now by God to uh, that they must be living a life reflected by the formation of their camp, right? With God's holiness at the center of their intentions, their hearts, their minds, and their lives. These, uh, these two perspectives are very important, I think, to grasp as we consider the purpose of God, uh, uh, sorry, the purpose that God has in establishing the armies, the priests, and the people of God. Remember that he has prepared them to enter into the land of Canaan. And remember, God knew that this land was crawling with these, this immoral and corrupt people that would seek to keep the Israelites from receiving uh, what God had promised. So because of that, God established and set up their army to fight and to protect them as they take up and what, it, what was promised them. Again, God knew that these people that were living in Canaan were wicked and they served other gods. And we see all throughout Scripture that Israel falls again and again into sin. Why? As they continue to intermingle and intermarry with the women and the cultures of the inhabitants of Canaan. This is actually a strategy of some of the surrounding nations to kind of topple over the power of Israel. They said, let's, let's get them to marry our women and, and we'll see if their God still, still walks with them. Therefore, God establishes the priesthood and he establishes this God-centered formation of the camp as a spiritual defense. So we see he's got a, a, a physical defense as in the establishment of the army and a spiritual defense as in the establishment of the priesthood. But just as we know about the history of God's people on their journey to capture the land that God has promised, they constantly go astray. They, they, they lose faith in God's plan and ability to help them, so much so that, that they are barred from entering into the promised land. It's, it's actually kind of ironic when you think about it. When, when they were on this journey to receive the blessing and the promise and the peace that God has for them as their inheritance, they actually run into, what they run into is deception, battles, and, and challenges. And we're going to be going through that as we uh, go through the narrative of the book of Numbers. But you know, all throughout the Bible, there are instances of foreshadowing, either between the Old Testament into the New Testament, or, uh, or, or uh, you know, looking back from the New Testament to the Old Testament. This is kind of called typology, where uh, certain events, times, uh, figures, and characters reflect something else somewhere else. For, for instance, we have, we know that the Passover lamb is a type or a foreshadowing of Christ. We know that the Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness was a reflection of Israel's 40 years uh, in the book of Numbers, and, and so on. You understand. In this instance, we see the promised land, uh, later even actually specified in the works of the prophets as Jerusalem, that we see that this promised land is actually a type for heaven, where man can dwell in the presence of God and can enter into what's called his shalom. You guys you might know it's, it is eternal rest, his peace. But as we read throughout the book of Numbers, we see that this, journey, this entire journey, what, what this entire journey lacks, is shalom, peace. Even before they enter into the land of Canaan, they're plagued with dissent from within, right? Problems and challenges from among their own people. They, they want to go back to Egypt. <laughs> they, they, they wish they could have just died. And when they actually do enter into the promised land, they run into all kinds of deceptions and battles, none of which reflect what heaven will be like. That's not what God's shalom, God's peace looks like. So what's going on? Why is the promised land a type for heaven? But when we actually take a closer look into the narrative of the book of Numbers, we'll start to see some parallels, some type and foreshadowing to the gospel and to the Christian life. Indeed, this journey of Bamid Bar in, into the wilderness is a picture of what the Christian life is like. And I see that there are five stages that appear evident to me, and hopefully that as you kind of follow along with me, that you can begin to kind of see the commonality between the struggles that the Israelites face in following God into the Promised Land with that of the modern Christian trying to live their life as salt and light in a world that rejects God and His ways. So I see five stages of the Israelites' journey that parallels the Christian life. Uh, I see the Exodus, 
the making of the covenant at Sinai. I hope you can read that. Is that too small? I apologize. Uh, we have the making of covenant at Sinai, the wrestling with doubts in Paran, uh, the 40 years of testing in the wilderness, and finally, the promised land. Let, let, let's just take a closer look at some of these similarities. Firstly, in, in the Exodus, we see God frees his chosen people from slavery and bondage in Egypt. In the new covenant, Jesus died for his chosen people and freed them from the slavery and bondage of sin. Galatians 5.1 If you look at Sinai, God makes his covenant with Israel at Sinai that was conditional upon their obedience, and he gave them the law written on stone, right on the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments. In Jesus, he established the new covenant in his blood. And that by his sacrifice on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that he has made a covenant not dependent on our works, but rather dependent on by grace through faith. Ephesians 2.8. And he has written his law no longer on stone, but on our hearts. He has taken away our hearts of stone and has exchanged it with the heart of flesh. Third, in Paran, right, where he had sent out the um, where he sent out the, 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 uh, the 12 spies. The Israelites wrestled and they struggled with doubt. They could not see past the giants that lived in the land of Canaan, but they could not trust God, even though he had promised to be faithful in the taking of the promised land. So in the Christian life, we too have moments of doubting God's promises and faithfulness, don't we? Perhaps, maybe when we were first saved, we found it so easy to have faith and to trust. We see great victories in our lives that uh, you know, over sin and addiction, we're going, man, Christ is all I want. We know, anyone who's, who's who we have, we've got tons of people here who have a legacy of faith. You know that when you go back, when life goes back to normal, right? when we get so busy with all the distractions of life, often not bad things, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's work sometimes even ministry. With their distractions in life, we get so tangled up in these things that we can't seem to hear God's voice. We can't seem to feel his presence or trust in his promises. And in those moments, we have to make a decision. We have to choose to obey God and to take him at his word, to believe that, as Philippians 1.6 says, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We have to believe that his Holy Spirit is more than enough to equip us for the victorious Christian living. More than enough to aid us in facing temptations, killing habitual or secret sin, forgiving others, and offering grace. We have to choose this day whom we will serve. Then, in the wilderness, this, this, um, where the Israelites wandered for 40 years, we have to remember that the number 40... In scripture is symbolic of a time of trials and temptations and testing. Three T's. In our pursuit of Christ, our faith that we have sustained in our Paran, we have to put, or, or sorry, will be put through a season of testing. I know a lot, we were talking in our young adults group, and a lot of them, we were talking about, listen, because we're going through a Bible study, um, it's called, it's called uh, God is Closer Than You Think. Come on Wednesdays if you want to. Want to take part, but uh, we were talking about you know, feeling God's presence in the mundane things of life, and a lot. Of, and the word, the, word the, the term I hear all the time tossed around, and I've used it as well. Because I'm going through a dry season, I'm not hearing God's voice. You know, and I'm sure many of you guys can relate. Circumstances happen. Maybe they shake us to the core. Maybe a loved one dies. Maybe we experience financial devastation. Perhaps you're. Experiencing a bout with illness or depression, and it feels like a long, dry season with no hope of restoration. Will God find us faithful in these moments, still following after Him? Making Him the center of our lives, just like the Israelites made the tabernacle the center of the camp? Will He find us faithful, striving after Him, even through bitter tears? And I've had us pray this, let your will be done knowing that the promise of hope is coming. If not in this life, then in the next. Will we be found faithful in our, our uh, wilderness? And finally, 
Uh, we see parallels between the conquering of Canaan, that is the promised land, with the victorious Christian life. When the Israelites got there into the promised land, they experienced deceptions when they sought out truth. They found challenges when they sought out wholeness. They, they, they found brutal battles with evil men who were influenced by the wicked God of this age instead of the shalom, the true peace and rest that was promised them in the land. On our journey towards shalom, that is the promised peace found only in the face of Jesus, we find so many voices trying to tell us how to live, how to spend our money, what passions we ought to give ourselves over to, and, and so forth. On this journey, we run into false beliefs and lies from the devil that keep us from trusting in God for the forgiveness of sins, keeps, keeps us from victory over sin, the, all, all those sins that plague us. We may not have physical Canaanites in our lives that are seeking to keep us from the rest that we find in Christ, but... We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, the spirit, uh, sorry, excuse me, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6 12. The battle and struggle for Canaan, God's promised land, which is abundant, which is a land of abundance, flowing with milk and honey. It's a type, and it's a foreshadowing for the victorious Christian life. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, he says, the, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Again, when Jesus sp speaks to his disciples in John 15 about the obedience to his word through abiding in him, he says this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We see that it's only through obedience to Christ that we can finally live life as he's intended. We, we, uh, we know that only as we draw near to Jesus, right, and get our life force from him, just as a branch does to a vine, so can we to live with true joy, that his joy may be in us and that joy may be complete. Submission to Christ does not bind us up, rather it frees us. You know, you know that verse, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Mm -hmm. Come on now. So, uh, now remember that God did not allow the older generation into the promised land because they sought to go back to the bondage they were in in Egypt. But only the younger generation and those who acted in faith and obedience to God were allowed to enter. And just like the promised land, the shalom and the peace of God can only be entered through the victorious Christian life when we acknowledge our weakness and our inability to overcome sin and the evils of this world. And we put our faith in Christ's work on the cross and in the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts to transform our lives and in turn, uh, in turn transform the world. We're just saying that um, here again, right? I'm not enough unless you come, right? That's, that's worship, right? And that's the gospel. That in our weakness, his strength is revealed, right? That's the beauty of the gospel. That our victory is sure, not because of our works, because we will never stop falling short, but because of Christ's awesome work on the cross. And as he said in John 16, 33, he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, shalom. In this world you may have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And again, Jesus says to John in Revelation 1, 18, he says, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. So we see that this promised land in the book of Numbers is a type for the victorious and abundant Christian life. That the only way in to this promised land is by faith and by obedience and submission to God and His awesome power. So now what? So what? That's, that's the question we want to answer. You may be saying, hey, I agree with you. I know that I need Jesus in my life to see any kind of victory. But how do I do it? Tell me, Pastor. Remember what we were saying earlier. There are so many teachers and so many preachers 
who could give you a history lesson. They could give you a word study on the meanings of all the names of all the representatives of each tribe of Israel. But if you are left without the answer to the question, how then shall we live? You have been failed as a congregation. Thanks be to God that we have a faithful servant like Todd who preaches every Sunday. Amen? Amen. Submission to his word. And he tells us, how then shall we live? This one, from this book. I don't want to, I don't, at least I don't want you to merely know information, but I want you to know God. I want our interactions with this word to be a transformational experience. That every time we open this book, we would say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And let the spirit guide us as he illuminates the purposes in the text, and that we would have a humble spirit and submit to it. Church, we are all on this journey of submission as we walk in awe and in wonder as we seek to apply God's word to our lives. So help us. <laughs> How do we live this victorious Christian life? So I'm going to give you two, uh, two uh, piece, uh, pieces of application that you can put into practice today. But, but listen to me. It, it may involve read your Bible and pray. Uh, but listen, don't tune me out just yet. I, 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 know that my, I know that sometimes my youth and my young adults, when, when that becomes the answer, they kind of roll their eyes. And it's a simplistic answer. Hear me out. Don't stop listening. <laughs> but let's begin to start thinking transformationally about these seemingly obvious solutions to our problem. Right? If we could just adjust our, our focus and our uh, perspective on how we read God's Word and how we approach God in prayer that maybe we would actually rejoice when we hear uh, encouragement to read and to pray. We'd say, amen. amen. Come on. Imagine if we saw reading scripture as, 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 as fervent seeking of God in fear and trembling with a spirit of humility. Imagine if we viewed prayer as boldly approaching the throne of God with confidence and faith, just like Jacob when he says, God, I won't leave, I won't let you go until you bless me. I won't let you go until you exchange this wicked heart of stone and replace it with this heart of flesh that longs to obey you. Because on my own, I can do no good thing and because your ways are perfect. How's that for reading the Bible and pray? Let's not miss the point. The problem is not in the solution. But the problem is in our hearts, in our attitudes. That being said, I do want to give you two application points that come specifically from uh, the book of Numbers, chapters 1 and 2. Two tips and perspectives for us to take on our journey to the victorious and abundant Christian life. Remember, in chapters 1, sorry, chapter 1, uh, God set apart all those 20 and up to be soldiers in order to take the promised land. And he set apart the Levites also for the role of priests. In scripture, we know the word set apart also means sanctified, that is to be made holy or to be set apart and given a holy purpose by God. And that's exactly what we see God establishing here in Numbers chapters 1 and 2. We see God structuring his people as priests and as soldiers operating under a covenant of faithfulness with God's holy presence, the tabernacle, at the center of their lives. And this is my prayer for all of us this morning, that we would act both as soldiers and as priests. Let's go into those two quickly, and then with that we'll end. First, we want to see, see ourselves as soldiers, warriors for God. All throughout Scripture, we see uh, the biblical authors using war and fighting language to describe the battle with sin and our battle with the world. What's more, the battle is often inward. Even though temptation and sin can come from without, our great mandate is to kill the flesh and to battle with our sinful nature. In, in order for us to fight in our promised land, to overcome and to taste the victory and rest in Jesus, we have to have a right view of sin and a right view of God's holiness. Sin, it's not a mistake. It's not an oops. It's sin. Sometimes I think we have, and myself included, we have too light a view of our shortcomings. 
Sin, we you know, church, sin is reprehensible to God. It is so awful in the sight of God that he sent his son to die for it. That's not oops. That's the, it's not an alternate way of living or doing life. It is the reason why Jesus came to die, and it's a fight. The Apostle Paul says, and it's on the screen here, Colossians 3, 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. These are some strong words. It's not just throw it away. It's not put it in a box under your bed and only look at it occasionally. It's kill it. Put it to death. Church, every time we pick up the word of God and read, we are training for war. <laughs> we are training our hearts and our minds to desire God's goodness above all else and to obey him unto death. Church, every time we pray, we are preparing for battle. We are beseeching God to strengthen us by the Holy Spirit to fight against the spiritual forces of this dark age and against sin because it is only in his spirit that we can be transformed uh, in the heart to love what is good and to hate what is evil. Now, church, let me be clear. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching kind of strong right now. <laughs> let me be clear. There is no pride or, or uh, self-righteousness when I say this to you. Don't misunderstand me. I have to fight every day to kill the sinful nature. I have to preach this truth to myself daily. I'm not perfect. But I am urging you, not in front of you, but alongside you as brothers and sisters, because we are all people in need of this daily transformation. I can't afford to miss a day. Talk about working out with some of the guys. I can't afford to miss a day. I need to get stronger. Why? Because the devil prowls like a roaring lion waiting to devour. I need thee every hour. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, he says, Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. This renewal of our minds must be a daily occurrence because, God, I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to lead the, leave the God I love. So if I am not devouring Scripture... If I am not clinging to Christ in prayer, then I've already lost the fight. I cannot love God by my own will. We need his spirit to fight. Therefore, church, live and act as a soldier for Christ. Number two, and with this we'll end. Let us act as the priesthood of the Levites. We remember the Levites, they were set apart for the holy purpose of serving the temple and serving the people. In an excerpt from uh, 1 Peter 2, 5-9, it says, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praise of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And here in the passage, uh, uh, I find two main functions of the priesthood that is a duty and a responsibility of the priesthood of all believers. That's, that's you, that's me, that, that's every Christian. First, I see an offering up of spiritual sacrifices to God. Romans 12.1 says that our spiritual worship is the offering of our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. Just like the sacrifices of old, the, these animals, they had to be uh, spotless, without blemish. And just like the temple, how it ought to be kept up and undefiled by uh, the evil of the world, so also must our bodies, our whole lives, be set apart for the purposes of God and made holy for the purposes of God. When we start to view our lives as sacrifices to be put before God, we suddenly start to realize the weightiness, the gravity of the implications. I want to give my God my whole body, my whole life, not just parts, not just the easy and the convenient bits, but my everything, undefiled. My thoughts, my hopes, my dreams, my aspirations, 
in my relationships, my finances, my sexuality, all of these things, bending their knee in submission to Christ and offered as a sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And the second function here, we'll close after this, is uh, the second function of the priesthood found in 1 Peter is this offering of, pr of praise, this offering of praise because of who he is and what he's done. The text says it very clearly. He said, it says, he has called us out of darkness and into marvelous light <laughs> by offering up our praises and our gratitude because of the glorious gospel of Jesus' saving grace. We see that God is glorified. That is, we ascribe the worthiness and the honor that's due him. Second, we declare, or sorry, by declaring and by sharing what God has done in our lives, we bring others into that beautiful relationship that God uh, extends to those who repent and put their trust in Him. It's an evangelism tool. That's where we share our testimonies. We are preaching. We are, we are sharing and declaring what God has done. He saved a wretch like me. Third, uh, the orientation of our lives in worship, it renews our hearts and our affection and it, and it endears us to Christ as we reflect and remember on what God has done for us. That's why scripture always, it, it always calls back and says, remember what the Lord has done for you. Remember as he brought you out of Egypt. Is he brought, and now we see, remember that God has brought you out of sin. The, the book of Romans is all about, remember that, that, you're, that, uh, that you have been put to death. Your sinful nature has been put to death with Christ. And by this remembrance of the works of God that he's done in the past, we let it serve as fuel for our faith in what he's going to do in our lives going forward. So that we would walk boldly going into our promised land, fully oriented and centered on Christ, our rock and our salvation, the center of camp. So will you stand with me now as we sing our final song together? And, and let's let it serve as a declaration of war against sin and our song of victory because God has already won the battle. Let's stand and sing together.